Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisick. During today's show, we will discuss next generation IT and networking technologies in the federal government. With me today on the show are Rear Admiral Danell Barrett, the Director, Cybersecurity Division and Department of the Navy Deputy Chief Information Officer, David Bennett, the Director of Operations Center and Chief Information Officer at DISA, John Felker, the Director of Operations at the National Cybersecurity and Communication Integration Center, Department of Homeland Security, Tim Silk, the IT Architect, U.S. Public Sector, Cisco, Scott Wilson, Director of Federal Sales at Brocade, and Dan Vos, the Senior Vice President, Defense and Intelligence at Lidos. We're going to talk about next generation technology. It's be exciting stuff here. Uh, we can all learn new things, at least I will. Uh, let's get started with uh, Rear Admiral uh, Danielle Barrett. Uh, can you tell us about the, some of the progress you're seeing with using, you know, what I would describe as the next generation technologies uh, over at the Navy? Right. So the Navy has a big focus on moving to the next generation, even with some of the challenges we have right. with acquisition and things like that. We're making very good progress. Um, we're using some of the same tools that industry needs and uses as well for agility on networks and security, better improved mm -hmm. cybersecurity on networks. Um, we look to have more virtualized servers to leverage the commercial cloud, um, hardware efficiencies, um, shared infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, even autonomous vehicles, which are all uh, autonomous and right. uh, um, unmanned vehicles, which are all part of the network, the larger network. Network. So our network's very, very large and complex, and so it's not something that we can homogeneously implement a lot of times. So as we look to specialize in certain technologies, we look, okay, is this an enterprise application, or can we at least get started in a, in a niche market right. within that enterprise and then grow from there? Right. And you made a great point about uh, right, up, right off the bat about getting technology in the government. Sort of like <laughs> since getting out of government, sort of been like my one pet peeve of how to get things in faster, you know, in innovative and creative ideas in faster, because, it, you know, it, it's such a long time of breaking into federal markets for uh, new technologies. Uh, John Felker over DHS. John, tell us about some of the technologies, uh, progress you're making with new uh, next generation, let's say, technologies over DHS. Sure. Uh, so, uh, like like uh, Admiral Barrett said, that we're, we're constantly looking for um, things that can improve our ability to, to, to carry out our mission. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we've been uh, focused on for the last year and a half or so is a uh, 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 a joint effort with NSA called Integrated, Integrative Adapted um, Cyber Defense. So okay. it's more machine learning. It's more, yeah. more of a uh, look at the big picture, um, and not with not with humans. Look at the big picture with some of the machines and some of the algorithms that can sort some of this information out, uh, right. and then and then channel it towards the humans that can put the wetware to work and, yeah. and start thinking about what does this really mean, and then how do we share it more effectively uh, with, with some of our partners yeah. to be better at cyber defense. Sure, what's normal, what's an anomaly, what uh, you know, what should be coming in, what's not not coming in, those and kinds of so, things. Doing so at machine <coughs> speed, which I yeah. think is really important. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's not like a, the age-old intelligence problem is, is, okay, let's think about it, let's analyze it, let's put together a product, let's give it to decision makers and go out and do things, and and the cyber wor world moves so fast, we can't afford to do that. So right. we've got to have machines doing the thinking, and in some cases, the machines doing the thinking and the acting. Yeah. You know, one of the challenges we have with with our um, um, automated indicator sharing program is that we're sharing out a lot of indicators to both the federal government and uh, some of our critical infrastructure partners, um, and and we've yet to see a real big. Uh, embracing of okay I've got an integrated indicator it's come automatically right. my, their machine is talking to my machine can I take automated action based upon those indicators and we're we're now working on ways to make those indicators Very more cool. valuable and more, more useful so that people can decide all right what's my risk how do I build that risk into the machine and right. then let the machine take action? There you go. Sounds a little bit like Howl in that 2001 Space, space Odyssey movie, but uh, hopefully we don't get to that point. But uh, Scott Wilson over at uh, Brocade, uh, what are some of the uh, areas of progress where Brocade is supporting the, your uh, government customer? Yeah. Well, Jim, Brocade is an infrastructure provider, mm -hmm. so it's been our role to provide good data to the programs that 
the Admiral and John have been describing in their machine learning environments, right. AI environments, and basically make sure that the information we're providing from this infrastructure is both high quality, focused on what is the task and the question that you're trying to resolve, and then actually be in a position to have our infrastructure be responsive or programmable to whatever data and decision you decide to make with it. Uh, that is going to be key to be able to react, respond, and adapt sure. and migrate your infrastructures in sure. the future. Ab absolutely. Well said. Uh, David Bennett, I know uh, this uh, you're trying to stay ahead of the curve with the, uh, the large customer base you support. What are some of the technologies you're looking at um, for implementing uh, as we move along here? So a couple of things real quick. Uh, we're putting a lot of focus on software-defined networking so that we can, in a automated way, reconfigure the network on the fly so as we have to deal with threats uh, in changing situations, we don't have to use a lot of people to go around and, and punch devices, et cetera. We can actually go leveraging software, go in and be able to reconfigure and eliminate threats, uh, restructure, reconfigure, do the things necessary so we can add more capability as well as counter cyber threats that may be showing up in the network. Yeah. Uh, the, the other piece is really uh, not so much a technology as it is how do we leverage technology to see a broader picture of the entire Doden? So our joint regional security stack that we're deploying across DOD now for the first time gives us the ability to roll up the cyber picture as well as the NetOps picture across the Dizen so that we can see what that world looks like, whether you're in the Army or the Air Force, at any post camping station, we now get to see that as a collective picture of what's coming across the network versus a localized view that you couldn't see before uh, from the enterprise level. Right, so you're, you're, I assume you're gaining a lot of speed and a lot of agility to do things a lot faster and make decisions a lot quicker. Absolutely. Uh, excellent. Dan Voss, uh, how about that Lighthouse? How are you, uh, what, what kind of progress are you seeing with Next Generation and supporting your customer base and helping them move forward? Sure. For us, uh, software-defined networks is a, is a big technology, as uh, Mr. Bennett alluded to. It's something we're focused on, um, both with our internal R&D as well as delivering to the um, DISA and the DOD at large. We see um, a number of advantages, um, a game changer for networking. We think it's the future of networking. Mm -hmm. um, the, the ability to abstract software from the hardware, to, to abstract, you know, um, the control plane from the data plane, right, um, yeah, is enabling a lot of flexibility uh, for, for operators. Um, they could develop new network-based applications um, that they couldn't before, um, and, it, and it's with them um, to meet the mission. So things like uh, bandwidth scheduling and calendaring, these are all things that become easier to do and, and cheaper. And for the users, uh, it's a different experience as well. We, we talk a lot about, in the cloud world, uh, spinning up VMs. Well, now in SDN, users can spin up new network right. services. They can go from an order entry system all the way through um, to order a new VPN, for example, or add a site to an existing VPN is, is just one example. Right. And this goes automatically from the user's entry all the way to the low-level configs to the Excellent. devices. So commercial world has invested now truly billions, and, and right. more is coming um, from vendors and partners. Yeah. Um, and these are things that we think that are there uh, for the federal government to take advantage of. Yeah, I hope so. And like in my earlier comment, we can get them in quick. Hopefully, uh, you know, maybe this modernization act that's being talked about uh, might uh, might be an impetus to get things moving quickly. Uh, Tim Silk over at Cisco. Um, I assume Cisco thinks out there about the next generation and things that are going to be happening. Uh, what are some of the areas of progress you're seeing that you uh, just can support your customer base with? Yeah, absolutely. So there's definitely a theme around software-defined, abstracting, abstracting the, the software from the hardware. Um, but I, I would abstract that further to say we're very focused on enabling services, which, which really means uh, facilitating the deployment of applications. So an application really is the service that we're providing when it comes to it, whether it's an on-prem type service or an off-prem type of service. So with that comes a very heavy focus on simplifying operations. We have to, uh, and again, software is what facilitates that. We simplify the operations and provide ourselves the opportunity to speed up the deployment of those applications and those IT services, whether, again, whether local or remote. Uh, and then heavy focus on analytics, uh, as was mentioned before. Um, there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of data on the network. There's a lot of data stored in systems across the whole infrastructure. So unleashing the power of that data 
and being able to use it for uh, to, to enable us to uh, support automation. So we can we deploy a, 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 a system that allows us to orchestrate sure. the infrastructure. We can we can start to automate things, which really helps us to speed up delivery and deployment. Yeah, excellent. Um, it's funny. Last week, uh, Tom and I did a event with chief data officers, and a lot of the points you just made there were made at that uh, that roundtable that we we had with them. Um, let's talk about a specific program. A lot of times our listeners like, you know, hear about the global progress, but they'll say, you know, can you point to a program maybe that comes to mind where you think some of these new technologies will, will really make a big difference? Let's start with Dave Bennett this time. Dave, can, if I asked you to point to a program that where you think uh, will benefit from uh, these uh, newer technologies, does something come to mind? Yeah, I'll go back to my comment about the Joint Regional Security Stack. Uh, it, it is a, a heavy investment, if you will, across the department to basically move the uh, security uh, infrastructure that's at every post camping station up to a regional level so that you can now start to see what that cyber picture, what that, uh, that, that IT picture looks like, if you will, across an entire region and start to see what the real threats are that are coming into or out of that, that area. So you get a more enterprise view of how the network at large is, is working. You start to see how different organizations do cyber, uh, how they react to cyber threats. And you start to see uh, and, and move towards a common way of doing business. One of the problems we have today, in my opinion, is that everybody has a right. style they like to use in doing cyber defense. One service will do it one way, one combatant command will do it one way. So we have a variety of different methodologies and tool sets that we leverage across DOD. JRSS is really trying to uh, standardize that from the standpoint of a common suite of tools and technologies that we implement in a standard way. So it doesn't matter if you are an Air Force organization or if you're an Army organization, you're leveraging that same right. set of infrastructure. So now we start to get to that common operational yeah. picture yeah, of excellent. what that cyber footprint looks like yeah, so that excellent. we can now react to that And quickly. you can eliminate the weakest link because, you know, uh, if you get to everyone doing things in a common direction, then you can eliminate those weak links that may be out there somewhere in that network. Uh, John Felker, um, <clears throat> what comes to mind in terms of a program if I said, uh, where's <clears throat> think of a, a program that will really benefit from some of these newer technologies? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier about IACD okay. and, 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 and build upon what Dave said uh, with respect to, um, for lack of a better term, common operations. Um, one of the values of IACD is that the machine is going to do a lot of the upfront thinking that has to be done now, and it's going to do it in a consistent way. Instead of having five different services or seven different government Very agencies point, doing defense a different way. Very good way, playoff there. Very good right? playoff there. Uh, the, 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 the machine will think for you through the way to do it. And then the next step is integrating this into some of the larger architecture. Uh, and when you do that, then, then there are um, playbooks that the machine will generate so that everybody doing cyber defense in the same way. That has a lot of benefits. We know what each other is doing. We're talking the same sort of language. We're seeing the same sorts of things based on the um, what the machines are telling us as, as they are working through uh, the analysis. And then, it's, and then it's down to the creativity of the humans that are on, yeah. on the end of things, right? The machine gives you an answer. Yeah, that doesn't quite look right. And, and then that's when you put the humans to work and really do the heavy-duty thinking that a machine may or may not be able to do. So yeah, I, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it sounds exciting to me, too. You know, when you get that, uh, the sort of like the, the things that have to get done, get done initially so that you're handing the information, the decision-making information to the right. human right. beings. I mean, our, gener our general philosophy in the end kick is if we can have a tool, uh, an application, uh, a machine mm -hmm. do uh, a set of work, uh, then we, we're going to try to do that yeah. because that frees up the the smart people to focus on to focus on the, the stuff that, that needs to right. be made based upon the information the machine exactly. is giving you. Exactly. Excellent. 
Uh, Rear Admiral Barrett, um, if I asked you to pick a program that you think these new generations will greatly benefit over at the Navy, what would uh, what comes to mind? Uh, for us, I would say, I mean, it's our, our float and shore networks are run by different programs. So the uh, float networks with IT21 and Canes and our shore networks with Engine uh, would both benefit from the same kind of things that Dave and John were talking about, the mm -hmm. AI and the advanced analytics. And we have to remember, too, that we consider our networks war fighting platforms, just like an aircraft, care, an aircraft or a ship, a submarine. Um, and so that is our information platform for, for fighting. And that's not an uncontested environment. And so we have to think, too, as we apply these technologies, our adversaries are using the same technologies sure. very creatively. Right. And so we have to always think not just in terms of defense, but what kind of actions could they take, TTPs that could make us not trust potentially the data we see. Um, so, you know, cyber situational awareness tools are very important for us, just like these gentlemen were talking about as well. But how do I know that my adversary, a sophisticated adversary, right. hasn't affected that and can I trust those data? Right. So, so our challenge becomes even more um, complicated when we look at the low cost of entry into this war fighting domain and how our adversaries may use that as well. So our programs have to look at it from the good guy side and the bad guy side yeah, at the same excellent, time. Yeah. Excellent. It's like the early days of antivirus software and things like that. People knew that as soon as that product came out, the bad guys knew what the product does, so it's an immediate crazy. challenge for them to figure out right. a way to get around it. Um, Tim Silk, if I asked you over at uh, Cisco, to, does a program come to mind uh, that you would highlight that you think will benefit from uh, new generation technologies? Yeah, well, I, there, there isn't one program. I think most, if not all, of the programs will will, will benefit. I, and I, you know, I want to. I'll mention the American Technology Council just recently formed this year. Okay. Uh, a heavy focus on driving the government toward a a singular singular direction in terms of modernization, uh, consolidation of of infrastructure and systems, uh, and then a, a heavy focus on shared services, mm -hmm. uh, cloud computing, if you will, and then um, how to resource all of that. Whether whether you're talking about the the staffing of the the technology administration itself, or uh, in terms of which systems are the ones that we need to take forward and modernize and which ones we need to sunset. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of developments in terms of, again, um, agility and, and the, the ability to rapidly deploy some of these, these networks and systems um, that, that are going to help benefit all of these programs. Right. Yeah. Well, well put, well put. Uh, Scott Wilson, what do you think? If I asked you to point to a program you think that uh, new technologies will greatly benefit, what comes to mind? Well, as Tim stated, the, the reality is the infrastructure programs that we have out there today, that is our first and our last mile that you have to live with. Mm -hmm. And so we can have these emerging technologies where we get great decision-making tools that sift through these mountains of data and then give us this point of information to go focus on to make a change. The question is, is this infrastructure that I have in place that takes me a decade to upgrade or modernize, is it going to be able to respond to me? And so the, the challenge there is that decisions we make today we're going to live with for the next decade. The, the tools that we develop right now are going to be shared in an environment. You're going to create machine learning type of environment that's going to be specific to your task, but you're going to be able to let's say, outsource that yeah. to other people with similar things, because each of us now are creating these things in our own stovepipes, yeah, right. right? But we're specialists in those yes. stovepipes, and they have use everywhere. Yeah. Make one, choose many. Uh, Dan Vos, um, what comes to mind in terms of a program? Does any program pop up in your head as to uh, be greatly benefit from these technologies? Yeah, sure. Continue on the theme of, of cyber. Um, so for us, we, we defend uh, the boundary of the DOD's network, the DODIN, um, as well as on the regional side in the, in the joint uh, regional security stack. There's opportunities there. We see at multiple level, levels of defense um, in the cyber battlefield, uh, at the sensor layer, uh, the data layer that the analysts access, as well as the infrastructure that carries it. Um, I think one important um, aspect that we see that's, that uh, should be brought to bear is leveraging open source. I think Admiral Barrett had uh, mentioned it. Our adversaries are creative. They right. have access to the same tools that we have. Right. Um, having an additional capability to create custom signatures, custom countermeasures, based on the fusion of the data that you see, um, allows us to stay a step ahead. I don't think it's the only answer. I think um, machine learning is ultimately something that needs to complement our analysts. 
Um, but these are areas we, we truly believe uh, can benefit from um, a mix of uh, uh, COTS products as well as uh, open source. Yeah, excellent point. Excellent point. Um, we need to talk a little bit about some lessons learned and uh, <clears throat> some of the challenges we face. And But before we do that, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with Rear Admiral Danell Barrett from the Navy, David Bennett from DISA, John Felker from Homeland Security, Tim Silk from Cisco, Scott Wilson from Brocade, and Dan Vos from Lidos. We're talking about next generation technologies and how they're going to work their way into the government. Uh, we've talked a bit about some progress and programs. Let's talk about some of the lessons you're learning and trying to get these technologies implemented. Let's start with John Felker over at DHS. John, what are some of the things you're learning that you would per perhaps pass on to others that are trying to uh, do what you're trying to do? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we, we, we've learned a couple of things internally from a process standpoint uh, about really working hard on the front end to define requirements. Um, we haven't done as good a job as we should have done in the past. Uh, the requirement uh, envelope is wide open and we're trying to refine that a little bit so that we can say when we have all this great technology out there and all these different things that we can do you know it's like a kid in a candy store right, right? Uh, so what 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 do we really need to do from a requirement standpoint and then prioritize that uh, so that we can go after the things that we really need and then I think the next step is how do we implement that in a rapid fashion? And just like everybody else in the federal government, we're challenged by sure. uh, acquisition rules, uh, but there's been some creative uh, work done at OPM particularly. Cl Cliff Triplett did a really good job of working on a, uh, a way to, to get a couple of uh, of players, a couple of three players in, and and do sort of a bake off mm -hmm. uh, about uh, with technology at, at a really low rate, and then as that's going on, uh, look at okay, what's the acquisition strategy for this in the long term? Uh, it, simple things like buying buying a test on a P card, sure. uh, and then and then and then going and getting it, and then while you're doing that, figure out how do you put that into the bigger acquisition process and do it fast, yeah. because if you wait 18 months or two years for that acquisition, then you you've already lost. Yeah, right. Right. There's four more versions That's of technology right. that are, are out there today. Um, Danel, uh, <clears throat> Rear Admiral, how do you, what are some of the lessons learned that you see that you pass on to say others that uh, things you think are important? So what I would say is particularly in the age of accelerating technology, I mean, uh, five years ago, no one ever heard of Uber and autonomous vehicles, and but that is going to revolutionize, for example, how we live. You know, future kids today, born today, probably won't learn to drive cars. Um, you know, it, you probably won't have car dealerships and rental car companies and pet boys or, you know, car parts companies in 10 years from now, potentially. I mean, the whole model revolutionizes uh, really so we have to identify what are those revolutionary technologies. They're not a panacea, but they're going to overcome potentially our old business practices in the Navy. So it's people, process, and technology. The technology is not a panacea always, but we have to rec recognize what are those ex uh, revolutionary technologies that will fundamentally change yeah. our warfare, and how do we put in place the people, process, and technology to advance that for our advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, it's not a, um, a lot of times we'll look at the technology as a panacea, and sometimes it's something easy. I mean, I never had to tell my kid, you're going to use Snapchat and you're going to yeah, like right. it. I mean, yeah, they love it because they see it and they work it and, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> and so we want those kind of technologies that people rapidly see the benefit to their 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 operations or what they're doing. Excellent points. Excellent points. And uh, I got seven grandkids. never thought about the fact that I want necessarily have to teach them how to drive a car in the future, I guess. Uh, you know, a machine will do that, or uh, the car will take them wherever they need to go. Fascinating stuff. Uh, David Bennett, um, what do you think are some of the lessons you're learning along the way as you try to introduce new technologies into uh, uh, your systems? So, so the tools that we use are pretty broadly used across the department. They're, everybody uses the very same tools. I mean, there's, there's X, there's a bunch of them, but they're all pretty much the same. Uh, so everybody uses the same, like Splunk as a case in point. Everybody likes Splunk. Right. Uh, so the problem we see, the lessons learned that we see, are the fact that from a TTP, a CONOP, so how do you do things, everybody has a different way of using the same tool. They look at it differently, they, they configure it differently, they use the output of that tool in a different way. Uh, and that's okay if you're sort of an island by yourself. Right. But if you're trying to look at it from an enterprise perspective, Correct. you really have to get to a common 
set of processes and TTPs that say if we're using a particular tool for an outcome, then we need to use it consistently so that we know that the data coming in and the data coming out is understandable across the board and not tailored to a specific scenario that, that may be suboptimal for the enterprise. Sure. Uh, and so that's one of the biggest things we're having to deal with right now is not so much the, the hardware device itself, but how do you use it and how do you use it consistently throughout the enterprise. Yeah, excellent point, excellent point. Uh, yeah. But I want to ask, ask a question about that, Dave. I mean, um, th I, I get where you're going in terms of standardization and, and trying to get uh, consistency of data and things like that, but, but um, what about the, creative, the creativity that you could potentially limit uh, by some of those youngsters that get on this set of tools, I'm supposed to do it this way, okay. But what if I did it that way? Do you, do you still allow enough room in your program to, to have those kinds of things a come absolutely. out? Absolutely, we're, we're looking for the best practices across the board. So it's not a static world, if you will, but if we do find a better way to do it, let's push that across the enterprise as opposed to keeping it stovepiped within one small user group. Yeah, it's continuous improvement processes. Exactly. And when what you, somebody comes up with something that's creative and interesting, move it across the enterprise. Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, Dan Vos, what do you think are some of the uh, <coughs> lessons that you're learning along the way as you try to get new technologies into your customer base? <coughs> yeah, a few things, and not all of them are actually uh, technical. I think one is stakeholder engagement is critical. Um, oftentimes we, we have any technology, the, the benefits are clear to us, you know, engineers. Um, but actually engaging not just the program office, not just contracts, but the end users, the stakeholders themselves, right. um, whether it's through training, education, those types of things are critical because you run the risk of delivering a technology that wasn't anticipated or expected, and in the end it could cause delays in ultimately getting to that, you know, final operating. Uh, capability. I think another one too is don't underestimate um, legacy interfaces. It's not often you have the luxury of a pure greenfield deployment. Many times a new technology that you're introducing has to interface with legacy systems, whether they're OSS systems, uh, BSS systems, it doesn't matter. Those systems aren't often well documented right. and, and um, significant effort should be put up front in understanding them and um, and understanding how your new technology is going to interface with them so that it is seamless to the end user from that perspective. Very interesting. Uh, Scott Wilson, what do you think are some of the lessons you learned along the way here? Key data point that Dan just brought up is the, the process and the procedure of managing your legacy systems plus migrating in your new systems and documenting that, that workflow, that process is key right now. The lessons learned you get from these adoption of technologies, you don't start learning them until you deploy them. So you right. gotta deploy them. And the good news is, is that you can deploy some of these tools and these functions today without waiting for us to certify the product, without waiting for you guys to figure out how to evaluate the product. You can actually do this in your traditional buying process that you're doing right now. You have to deploy something. You're buying products today, you're taking it off the shelf, you have to configure it and you have to deploy it. Well, those are all kinds of things that, that SDN technology has been delivering for a few years. Pre-configuration of devices, putting host names, IP addresses, policy, procedure, con all the right. pieces in there along with your business rules, right? That's what SDN was supposed to deliver sure. and it can. You don't have to wait for us to certify it. You can use it in a pre-deployed manner and then go have somebody else rack stack and turn it on. So it's never touched your network. It doesn't have to be certified to do that, right? So you can get your hands on these tools and what you're gonna find in these lessons learned is that your folks, your networking and IT folks that traditionally serve the command line interface or a network operations management system, is they're gonna now start being maybe Python scripters and developers yeah. and, and writers, code right. writers, right? right? It's gonna be a new skill set that's gonna come out of this. But you gotta get started in order to capture your process, your workflows, and you're gonna have to get started to develop these new muscles of writing your own code and applets tailored to your business. Excellent. Excellent point. Uh, Tim Silk, what do you think are some of the lessons learning along the way with getting new technologies into customer <coughs> solutions? Yeah, everything that's been talked about is, it's, it's, it's a lot of the same themes. And I'll, and I'll touch on three different things. Um, the first, people, process, and technology. Absolutely have to consider all three together because a new technology can change 
how we how we do things. It can change the work processes. It it can be affected by the culture that we're used to working in, from you know command line interfaces now to to Python programming, which is very consistent, right? Um, the next thing is I think have a uh, again some of this was mentioned. Have a DevOps mindset. I want to do continuous integration, continuous deployment. I want to be able to build, test, and deploy very quickly. And again, it goes back, that goes back to speed. And then the third, in terms of legacy systems, sometimes we want, to, we want to just flip them. But we have to remember that those legacy systems are, many of them are mission critical. So there has to be a, 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 definite, a definite migration um, with a consideration toward, toward legacy, but the future as well. So there's, a, there's you have to balance the excellent, and, and excellent. migrate. I heard that balance with legacy yeah. quite a bit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> big, big, yeah. <clears throat> Rear Admiral uh, Barrett, what's a hard thing to do? What's a challenge, a constraint? Something you gotta get over, the hurdle you gotta get over in order to get where you wanna go to get these technologies in. What's, what's something that's difficult? Well, I think sometimes uh, the most difficult pe is part of the people person, people part, um, and to get people to understand the art of the possible. And sometimes as technologists, they speak too geek speaky, and it doesn't yeah. translate to anybody, and they can't see it. So you really have to have people who can talk about these technologies in a way that's meaningful to the people that could potentially leverage them. They have to think about it in terms of the processes that would change, and in our case, the war fighting operations that could be enhanced right. by the use of these technologies. So it takes someone with some some savvy communication skills to be able to communicate that and then to get over uh, you know some of the you know we do have bureaucracy obviously we Absolutely. all do in organizations <clears throat> and you know where are the pockets of institutional inertia potentially that right. could roadblock and again piloting like you said small pilots get them out there show people the art of the possible show them what it could mean to their business line or their operational line in our case yeah I like that and I like that comment that uh, to make about DevOps too you know I think to get something out there relatively quickly doesn't create that expectation that you know I have to wait two years before I actually see progress. <clears throat> John Felker, tell me something difficult, a challenge, a constraint, uh, you know, an issue or something you've got, a hurdle you've got to get over in order to get these technologies in. The acquisition process. Acquisition process. Okay. I mean, it's, it, it hasn't changed. Um, there's been a lot of great efforts to try to improve it, to streamline it, what have you, particularly in the space where everything moves so fast. Um, I mentioned the, o the OPM pilot effort that, that they've been doing a really good job with. We, we recently had a success where we, we did a, a three-way bake-off on a, uh, a replacement indicator management platform for our folks. Um, and that was very successful in that we, we actually had the technology folks, the folks that were t talking geek speak, uh, that would have to implement it and build it, along with the analysts who were actually doing the work, sat down and, and they, they scored it. How does this work? Is this comfortable? Does this give us what we want it to do? Uh, do we do it fast? And so we, we did a three-way bake-off. We came up with a, a solution, and and now that it now now and we have a really creative guy who came from DISA, uh, Martin Gross, uh, who is who is uh, uh, putting in place a limited operational deployment uh, of the the new tool, so that right. we can we can make the acquisition process work for us. Uh, within the constraints that it, it provides, and I think we're going to have some really good success with this particular tool. And, and from our folks' perspective, um, both uh, the people doing the work, which was very difficult before because it was manual intensive, it doesn't need to be, uh, and from the product that we produce right. for our customer base, the, the indicator sharing, the information that we share with the, uh, the federal government and the critical infrastructure partners, it's going to be a whole lot better and faster. Yeah. Excellent, and um, and we already alluded to the fact that when the next generation comes up, they're not going to be used to this length of time it takes to do things. They're going to they're going to want an app. They just download and run. That's right. Uh, Dave Bennett, what do you think? Something tough, a challenge, a constraint, something that uh, you consider you know you got to get over that hill in order to get to where you want to be. So change is always difficult, but the uh, piece I want to focus on is scale. Uh, the, Doden, the DOD information network is millions of endpoints. I have within the DISA area of responsibility, I have hundreds of thousands of infrastructure devices. So when a zero day event occurs, the speed at which I have to execute to be able to put that patch out globally across the network is very problematic. So anything that can be done to 
give us early warning of issues or allow us just that that instant of of awareness as soon as it becomes yeah. known is really key for us to try and stay ahead of things because for me to deploy a patch that comes out for a box will take me days, weeks, months, just depending on how widespread because I literally have to deploy it from one end of the world to right. the other. Uh, and some things can be done electronically uh, via software-defined networking or, or other automated ways, but some things require you to actually go out and touch a box. Right. And so uh, it becomes very problematic. So the scale at which we have to operate and do it in a rapid fashion is, is very problematic. So we're always looking for ways to innovate yeah. in that. I participated in a webinar not too long ago of uh, the future of um, decision making when time to make decisions begins to approach zero because things have to be made done that quickly. Uh, Scott Wilson, um, what are some of the challenges, the constraints, the things that you, you, you know, you, you got to get done in order to get where you really want to be? Certainly. So there's, there's two perspectives here. One of them is a, as an organization that brings you solutions, right, to the government solutions. We have to make a, a couple of calculated scenarios on when the convergence of the government adopting the solution actually is going to happen and time that with our certification entries so that both of those meet at the same time. We gamble wrong, we basically we can move a whole technology cycle out of an opportunity scale for us. So what that means is we may go years without a revenue opportunity. It's bad business. So, so that's the first challenge as a manufacturer. We have to basically decide when are you going to adopt the product and when can we make it available to sell to you. The next thing is going to be working with our partners who are bringing to the solutions, developing and integrating them, working with you and your requirements, is how do we bring them up to speed during their business development stage? And so that, coupled with the scale and the other pieces in the environment you operate with, is the complexity we have to deal with. That, that's hard, right? And that's make or break for companies. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tim Silk, what do you think uh, tough things to do? Yeah, I was going to say complexity is definitely something that, that we've got to overcome and, and continue to, to simplify, not only from a technology perspective, but from an operations perspective, from a culture perspective. Um, but, I, but I do think it, you know, marrying the need for well-defined requirements up front with the speed of technology and the, and the need to get technology deployed, yeah. I think is, is, is going to be an ongoing challenge. Uh, and then as we, you know, we're talking about AI, we're talking about machine learning and things like that. A lot of data out there. How do we get our arms around all that data? Sure. I think that's always going to be a continuing challenge. Absolutely. Uh, Dan Vos, what do you think uh, some of the tough things, difficult things, challenges you need to overcome to really get your, you know, things out there that we want to get out there? I think if you reflect on um, um, the process in which we deploy new technologies today, right, through the procurement, development, test, deploy, with the problems of scale, it, it quickly tells you that one of our biggest challenges, sure. we have to change well, how we do there. things. Um, DevOps is an example, but in the right. end, I, I think what it requires is our sprints. We have to um, think about not the Big Bang <coughs> deployments, but perhaps um, attacking technology in small pieces. Right. Um, success <coughs> generates success. And if you can have success at a smaller scale that bring those stake that can bring those stakeholders along and you can build upon it. Um, but the technology is changing so fast um, that if you're in a two or three year cycle, by the time you deploy that technology, as we all know, it's, a, it's outdated, and then everyone becomes disappointed um, because right. a lot of time and money has been spent. That's right. So I, I think the uh, approach to deployment is, is a big right. challenge that we need to overcome. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well said. Um, we need to talk a little bit about uh, governance and then and turn towards the future here. And, uh, <clears throat> but before we do that, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum <clears throat> on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Rear Admiral Barrett from uh, the Navy, David Bennett from DISA, John Felker from Homeland Security, Tim Silk from Cisco, Scott Wilson from Brocade, and Dan Vos from Lidos. We've been talking about next generation technologies. Um, let's talk a little bit uh, briefly here about governance. Um, Rear Admiral Barrett, how do you go about the process to decide on which technologies? Is there some type of a board or whatever that uh, gives you some way of knowing which technologies to pursue? 
So in that regard, we really rely on our technical authorities, um, uh, our systems command, specifically uh, Spay War, and those to help us identify those technologies that are best suited for the enterprise or for a specific mission set. Um, and then we have, within the program offices themselves, they have governance infrastructure to decide what to move forward with. And then at the higher level, at the CNO level, H1 level, if, as, as we call it, um, you have governance boards that um, determine for the enterprise, is this the right way forward? Forward. So we have Navy um, uh, right. enterprise boards, and then we also align with this, of course, because you know we're not in this right. alone. You know, right. so we want to make sure the solutions we're putting in place will work across a joint environment as well. Excellent, John Felker. Uh, I'm sure DHS, being you know, 22 different entities or whatever it is, I'm sure everyone agrees right up, right out of the box <laughs> on which technologies you're going to implement. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the you know the the governance challenge is is has been compounded a little bit by the executive order, but I think it's a good thing because I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to get some consistency in the process, um, so that this department isn't totally different than that department is totally different from a third department. I think trying to bring it together in a consistent way is important, and then looking at what the requirements are. What is a mission requirement for this department? What is our mission requirement, and how how do we address that mission requirement? And what tools in the process do we bring together? In, in my mind, it's a requirements thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a requirement to do X. I don't want to be tied into X because sometimes something new shows up right. and it, we can be more creative about it, but I have to work with the folks that are going to implement it to make sure that our operators and their builders are on the same page. Uh, and so that process for us is really important. And I think we're starting to get our arms around that a whole lot better, at least in DHS, right. uh, in terms of what we do from an operational perspective. Yeah, because I'm sure it was um, a challenge. I know in the early days when I was still involved, it was, uh, you know, you're bringing together all these different entities with different <coughs> different sets of products, different sets of solutions, different models, and whatever. And so to try to just make sense of all that t takes time. And talk the same language, by the way, because everybody, everybody calls something different. Well, and you got drastically different kinds of missions in there too, you know, yeah. and, and so forth. Uh, David Bennett, how about uh, DISA? How do you go about trying to figure out which technologies are the ones that we believe uh, we want to bring into the mission? So we come at it from a couple of different directions. Uh, first off, we have an innovation organization within the agency who's constantly on the prowl for new and innovative capabilities that give us opportunity to move the bubble forward. That's interesting. Uh, secondly, we have a, uh, a what we call a net ops readiness review board, which basically looks at those tool sets from an operational perspective to say, how do you operate this capability? And is it mature enough that we can put it into the infrastructure and actually be able to use it, understand it, and get the value out of it that, uh, that we really need? <coughs> And then at the agency top tier, if you will, uh, you have the final decision about bringing that capability into the enterprise. Uh, we have what we call our strategic planning uh, committee. That role of, of that group is to basically provide that agency decision to invest in that resource uh, to bring that capability online because, as Admiral Barrett said, it is one team, one fight across Doden. Right. So as we put capability at the enterprise level, we've got to make sure that it's a capability that's compatible across the mill depths as well as the agencies, uh, and in many cases, outside of DOD within the federal space. Yeah, excellent. Well said, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do now is maybe shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about where we're going down the road. What's the vision going to look like? Um, you know, how are things going to change based on these new technologies being developed? So it's kind of like a put on, uh, look into your crystal ball here, everybody, and try to make some predictions about what these new technologies will mean for us or for our country or our government uh, down the road. We each have about, uh, about a minute and a, minute and a half or so to uh, express where, where this is all going. We'll start with uh, Tim Silk over at Cisco. Uh, Tim, where's this all going down the road? What's it going to mean to us in the future? What's the, you know, infrastructure in the future going to look like? Yeah, keeping my, keeping my technology hat on, I, I think automation is going to become more and more pervasive. We're going to see analytics play a significant role in how we deliver services, how we identify what services we need and when we need them. Um, and, and I think also from a, from a location of those services, I think most of them and I'll say two-thirds to three-quarters of the IT services provided in the government will be somewhere else. They'll be provided somewhere else. They won't be local services. So uh, we'll see a, an increasing percentage of those services, I think, move away from the organization and become centralized somewhere else. 
Interesting, yeah. I mean, city organization can focus on the mission right. and the technology and the infrastructure and uh, that supports the mission can be anywhere. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Vos, uh, what, what's it look like down the road to you? Where is this all going? What will it mean down the road as these new technologies come about? Um, I, I think uh, similar themes. Um, I, automation is, is here and it's in accelerating. Um, so I think in terms of IT operations, uh, there are things we do manually today um, that we already have the technology to overcome, and it's a matter of deploying them. So you can envision in that five to ten year window, IT operations becoming uh, closer to you know low touch to no touch in certain areas. Um, things that we do in um, incident identification and even resolution, um, there are tools that can help us automate that. Um, I think also on the cyber side, we've we've touched upon machine learning. We'll continue to. Uh, help us. We have some brilliant analysts that can reverse engineer malware, malware determine countermeasures, but they're human, and, right. and, and humans can scale only so far. Right. Um, and the attacks are only increasing. And then I would echo, I think, um, for the migration, we'll, we'll call it off-prem, um, to manage services, whether it's in compute and storage, or I could even envision on the network side as well, uh, perhaps starting at the edge. Um, I would, we'd envision additional managed services growing as yeah. we go towards the future. Yeah, interesting. We should uh, we'll keep keep hold of this. Like ten years from now, we'll play this back. You know, as a, if you go back ten years ago and think of what things were doing, uh, I, I would venture to guess that a lot of things that are happening today would have been very hard to predict ten years ago. Uh, <coughs> Dave. <coughs> I guess in your role, you are sort of uh, expected to be a strategic thinker and think out and look out and look at what's coming next and so forth. Uh, what do you see as uh, down, the, down the road to the future, how things will change based on these new technologies coming about? Uh, I think the biggest thing you're going to see different is we're going to use light differently. Uh, there's two things we're looking at in the agency right now. Uh, one is using colors of light as a way to modify the environment and push data across the networks, et cetera. Bandwidth. It gives you better bandwidth, it gives you better security, you can leveraging like SDN, you can now start to uh, group organizations together or com create communities of interest just by using different colors of light. Uh, so, so that's a very interesting thing that we're looking at. Uh, the other thing is what we call light fidelity. Basically, it's Wi-Fi using light. So imagine yourself sitting underneath the light no wires, no anything, and you're getting your information coming from that light source. Simply by changing endpoint devices, you're now able to get that uh, information in a way that can't be hacked, is secure, uh, has a narrow bandwidth, if you will, right now, but the point being is you now have a way that you can provide a more secure environment just by using light that's, wow. that's available. Wow, that is fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. I know we've been, <clears throat> been, I've been hearing about, you know, different type of fiber optics and, you know, using different colors for to increasing bandwidth and things like that. But uh, this was, this is taking it like another step forward. Um, excellent, excellent points. Uh, Scott Wilson, um, what's it look like down the road to you? Where are we all going? Where are we going with all this stuff? So where, where we're going is based on where we are right now. And, and over the last decade, we've spent uh, an enormous amount of time and resources getting better visibility into our infrastructure, what our applications are doing, and how to basically modify and manipulate them. The realities are is the, this amount of data coming from all of these sources is increasing dramatically day by day. And it's, that's not going to go down. It's actually accelerating sure. quicker. So we're going to then use these tools, be it what we call an AI or machine learning, to, to navigate and narrow those, that mountain of data down into usable points for our next action, resulting in automation. So automation is where we're going, but we've got to get these other pillars under control beforehand. And the, the key to this is you, you can't wait for the first two, the machine learning and the visibility pieces right. to come together to get to automation. You've actually got to start automating today. And 
the good news is the tools and infrastructure you deployed have, are some level of automation now. I mean, it may be a user on the <coughs> keyboards doing it, but scripts have been doing this for decades now. Now you're just expecting these tools to work together that you're developing to do it on their own. So the table stakes is get started. The, the value proposition is faster deployment and getting a longer life out of what you've already put out there today. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, if you could skip a refresh cycle so that you can invest in these emerging technologies, the savings are enormous, right? You've cut the procurement cost right. itself, the time and evaluation cost, the fielding and deployment cost. So if we can use these tools, just to extend the life of what you've got a bit longer, there is benefit immediately. Excellent, Excellent. Scott, can you talk to my kids and tell them it's okay to skip a refresh cycle when the new iPhones come out? <laughs> <clears throat> the math for that one. <laughs> uh, John Felker, what do you think, John? What, what's it look like down the road to you? Well, you know, we, we've, this morning we've talked a lot about the, the um, software-defined networks mm -hmm. uh, and uh, automation and uh, machine learning and things like that. Um, I, I think one of the things that's going to that's going to pop up in the next couple of years is uh, something that's called uh, intent-based networking. So intent-based. Intent so so you've developed. You take the software to find network, um, you, you've got your parameters, you've got some limited machine learning, uh, you build a, a decision engine in the front end that then allows the network to automatically adjust based upon what you want it to do from a mission perspective. Um, it, it's, I mean, I've only learned about it in the last couple of weeks, so I'm still kind of right. getting up to speed yeah, on it, but it's, it's an interesting concept so that we have software to find networks. Um, what I wanted to do something different that the now wants it to do and, and something different that they want it to do. Um, so we define those rules for the network up front and let the automation in the in the network define how it's going to do things. And it, the first I'd heard about light, that's going to be a really interesting part of this, I think, especially from a security perspective. Right. Excellent, excellent. Rear Admiral Barrett, what's it look like to you down the road? Uh, well, for me, I, I see like four kind of big key areas. Okay. One is the AI data analytics, obviously, and we've talked about that one significantly during the, the day today. So all those things that make things predictive for us um, and not reactive. Um, and second is autonomous vehicles, unmanned vehicles. Like um, we have a float platform now that's a completely um, uh, unmanned vehicle yeah. essentially and that's a first beta test out in San Diego now um, we'll see more and more of that both air subsurface and surface um, the third thing is the Li-Fi um, and we've been actually working with this on that Dr. Butler is doing some great work over there but we see advantages for that to do that skip generation of technology you know in China uh, that a lot of folks in, in other countries that didn't have uh, good telephone infrastructure everywhere they went right from not having telephones to having a cell phone you just right. don't bother with the middle road right so I see that with regard to RF and how we can use the Li-Fi spectrum afloat, not just for internal communications potentially, but for external communications. As you know, we're very reliant on satellites afloat um, for reaching sure. back to get to the grid, to get, get all our information. Um, if we have the opportunity to use a, an aerial layer that maybe we can use the Li-Fi to increase our bandwidth if we are not having, if we don't have access to satellites, it gives us another opportunity. And then the last piece is the human machine interface. Uh, you'll hear Admiral Rogers, you'll hear uh, Admiral Ty and folks in our community who are visionary thinkers already talk about this kind of uh, human machine interface and how that's going to further, further um, uh, get more complicated actually. And you know, think about Ray Kurzweil and singularity, you know, man and machine becoming one, right? So we have to have a workforce and a human uh, element that understands that. So it's not, again, just the technology. It's, okay, how are people going to react in that environment? How are we going to get them to leverage that? How are they going to become comfortable with change at that accelerating rate? Right. Moore's law is your grandma's law. I mean, 18 months, processor speed, right. that's, that's in our rear view mirror. So we have to be thinking in an accelerated way. Excellent. Excellent points. Excellent uh, discussion here today. <clears throat> Let me do my best to try to do a little bit of summary here based on I've been taking some notes. Uh, in progress, we talked a little bit about machine learning and actually taking action. Machines actually learning and be able, be able to take some action. Software-defined networks came up quite a bit in terms of progress. Uh, enabling of services, simplifying operations, and uh, use of analytics are things we heard in terms of where, where big progress is being made. When we talked about programs, we talked about the cyber situational awareness, some common operating platforms getting across, uh, how I, uh, AI and machine learning 
learning can be built into programs and to be built into what I heard is pretty much in almost all programs there are potential to build that in. And we brought up the American Technology Council and some of the things that they're doing uh, for specific programs. And lessons learned, I heard we need the front end requirements to be prioritized. Uh, we need to accelerate, find ways to accelerate programs, uh, build common processes in make sure customer expectations are understood. Uh, legacy in, in integration becomes a big issue because you know as these new technologies come in there's still a lot of old stuff out there that needs to be integrated. We heard about people, process, and technology. It's not just the technology, it's the people and the processes all have to be part of the equation. <clears throat> when we talk challenges, we talked about people, um, you know, the culture issues always out there and uh, getting the people on board here is, uh, is something. Uh, the acquisition issue comes up as it always does um, when we talk especially with the government folks about getting things done, you know, faster. Um, we talked about change and the need uh, to manage the change and the scale we're talking about. I know David brought up the scale. He's, when he was talking about the scale that he works with, it's just, you know, hard to even imagine and getting your hands around uh, something of uh, uh, that magnitude. Uh, when we talked about governance, we talked about uh, there's some commands in place, there's boards that are usually in place to help make decision making. Um, you look to try to get consistency with con uh, decision making. Um, I believe was, again, David brought up, it has an actual innovation organization that's looking out at new technologies and boards that look at tools and so forth in order to work it through a governance process to get it uh, in implemented. When we talked about vision, <clears throat> we talked about things that are manual today are all eventually moving to an automated uh, phase in the future. Uh, we heard about things going off premise. Uh, we heard about colors of light, which was fascinating to me and the kinds of things we're going to be able to do using light in the future, uh, including uh, Wi-Fi using light and things like that. Uh, we talked about intent-based networking, which was a new concept that came up here, as well as the human-machine interface. Um, with that, I want to switch over and thank our panelists for taking time from their very, very busy schedules to be here today and help educate us and, uh, and our listening audience. I want to thank our sponsors without which we don't have a program. Uh, thank my good friend Tom Treza, Treza Media Group that uh, helps put this all together uh, each month. Uh, thank our good friends at uh, Federal News Radio who always do such a fine job in accommodating us. And finally, thanks to our listening audience without which uh, we don't have a show and thank them for tuning in each month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.